what we're going to do in this first, uh, in this lesson, sorry, not this first lesson, uh, but in this lesson on the introduction to the philosophy of religion, we're going to begin by looking at ontological arguments for the existence of God. Now, we've already outlined in the last lesson that there are different ways in which one can describe how one can um, define how we can um, form the existence of God. Uh, we can form argumentation for the existence of God, looking at uh, a priori, a posteriori arguments, inductive and, and deductive reasoning. We're going to begin by, one of, by looking at one of the oldest forms of, of philosophical arguments for the existence of God, and these are ontological arguments. So we're going to begin by looking at really what it means to have an ontological argument. This means we have to examine really what ontology is. We're not going to go into a deep metaphysical analysis of what ontology is. For that, we've got a lesson already. But just outlining really what it means to do ontology. We're then going to look at Anselm's argument for the existence of God, arguably the founding father of, of the ontological argument. We're going to look at crit critiques of Anselm's argument, look at some criticisms. And then we'll look at some variations of ontological arguments, mainly looking at Descartes' ontological arguments, looking at Kant's critiques of ontological arguments in general, and then also looking at Malcolm's um, modern ontological arguments. So really, what is ontology? Fundamentally, ontology is the metaphysical study of existence. Okay, So effectively, it is the study of what it means to say something exists or something does not exist. So what does it mean when I say this thing exists or this thing doesn't exist? A more detailed and um, comprehensive explanation of the philosophy of ontology as well as an analysis of, of how we can determine different things that uh, and determine how we can form ontological commitments to certain things, um, that's in a lesson that we will link in the description below. Um, but when it comes to the existence of God, ontological arguments attempt to try and prove God's existence a priori. And what we know by a priori means that they work from principles by definition and using logic to determine the existence of God. We're not looking at empirical evidence uh, when we're trying to when we're trying to formulate an ontological argument. And as we've already mentioned in the last lesson, by contrast, an a posteriori argument uh, relies on empirical evidence and make determinations inductively rather than deductively. So let's begin by looking at Anselm's ontological argument. Really, what does he say? So Anselm was the Archbishop of Canterbury from, um, uh, you know, uh, he was around from uh, 1033 to 1109, uh, and he was also a monk. And he was one of the first, if not the first person, to develop an ontological argument. And really, what he was trying to do when he was trying to develop his ontological argument for the existence of God wasn't trying to convince non-believers and to try and prove God's existence necessarily, but rather from a perspective of, quote, faith-seeking understanding. Trying to understand God better by, uh, you, you know, and, and therefore bringing in, uh, being able to understand his own faith better. And these arguments can be found in a uh, quite hefty text um, called Proslogion, okay? And it usually exists in two forms. And we're going to analyse these two forms um, separately because most of the time people only really focus on the first variation of Anselm's ontological argument and not the second. So let's have a look at his ontological arguments. So Anselm argued that if we have an idea of God, okay, who is perfect in every single way, which is really a way in which we characterize um, God in at least the Judeo the Judeo Christian um, you know uh, understanding of, of God. Uh, really, from any kind of Abrahamic religious understanding, um, it's the idea that God is somehow perfect in every single way. And then Anselm argued that this means if they are perfect in every single way, then God must have to exist in reality. And his reasoning for this is. Because the characteristics of a perfect being, one of those characteristics has to be existence. Okay, let's use an analogy to, to show what he means, to show the rationale behind this argument. Okay, in order to have a perfect pizza, okay, there must be one that exists out there somewhere. In order to, uh, to have a perfect pizza, then surely one of the characteristics of this perfective, um, this perfect, uh, you know, pizza. Is that the pizza exists 
okay? If I, and you know, I'm just imagining a perfect pizza, then surely the real version of that perfect pizza um, would be better than the one that is in my in my imagination. So therefore, one of the characteristics has to be existence. Existence has to be one of the characteristics for something to be perfect. So let's have a look at this in the form of a philosophical argument. So from this perspective, we have premise one. God is, quote, that than which nothing greater can be thought. Okay, so if we're going to just, uh, you know, accept a Judeo-Christian understanding, an Abrahamic, um, you know, from the Abrahamic religions, God is the greatest. He's omnipotent, omniscient, you know, omnibenevolent, all these things. He's greater than that than which nothing, sorry, he is that than which nothing greater can be thought. Premise two, a real existing being would be greater than an imaginary being. So again, we can, if we're going to talk about this in terms of beings, okay, the most perfect dog that I can imagine, you know, the cutest, you know, you know, dog in the world, okay, that I can imagine in my mind will never be as good, okay, will never be as perfect as if that same dog existed in reality. The imaginary version is always lacking in, in some kind of characteristic. And Anselm argues that this characteristic that it's lacking in is, is existence. So therefore, conclusion one is, so if God is that than which nothing greater can be thought, that we have from premise one, then he has to exist in reality. Because in order to, because um, if he didn't exist in reality, then he can't be that than which nothing greater can be thought. So if premise two was false, okay, then premise one would also have to be false in when we apply this to God. And so therefore the final conclusion is, therefore God exists, not just in imagination, but also in reality. So let's have a look at the second variation of Anselm's argument. This is the first, that's the first variation, and we'll come back to it in a minute. But let's have a look at the second variation of Anselm's argument. So, in this second ontological argument, Anselm makes a distinction between what he calls contingent beings and necessary beings. I understand that that text is quite hard to read. I do apologise. So, by a contingent being, I'm just going to read this word for word because I do realise that that is difficult to read uh, with the formatting. So, uh, a contingent being is a being which comes in and out of existence, okay, and it depends on other factors for its existence. A necessary being is one which does not come in and out of existence. It is therefore eternal and does not depend on anything else for its existence. So let's have a look. Let's give an example of these two things. So a contingent being, it has to have two. It has two contributing factors that make it um, that make something contingent. There are two characteristics. One comes in and out of existence. What do we mean by that? Well, humans, for example, come in and out of existence. Okay, Winston Churchill in fourteen hundred didn't exist. There wasn't a Winston Churchill. I assume that the same Winston Churchill we're thinking about. Okay, so he was not in existence. He came into existence, and in, I believe the early eighteen hundreds. Okay, and then when he died in the nineteen seventies, I believe it was. Okay, he came out of existence. Oh, sorry, the 1960s. It was the 1960s. Anyway, regardless, he is shifted from being in a state of non-existence through most of human history, okay, to when he was born, coming into existence, and now in the 1960s, um, go, leaving, uh, coming out of existence. So that's characteristic one. Human beings come in and out of existence. And the second one is it depends on other factors for its existence, and again, human beings depend on other factors for their existence. So, for example, I would not exist if it wasn't for my parents, and if it wasn't for their parents, if it wasn't for their parents, etc., etc., etc. So those are external factors that have contributed to my existence. And there are also thousands of other ones. We can go all the way to the molecular level. You could, all, you could also even just talk about, from a perspective of, of, of physics, that the Earth is in a perfect position to be able to harbour life. So therefore, that is one external factor that has contributed to the existence of everything on Earth. So, for that, so with that being said, humans and animals and insects and creatures and stuff are all contingent beings. There is a period of time where they exist, 
okay and and then they come in and out of that existence and they also depend on other factors for their existence and a necessary being is something that's completely opposite it does not come in and out of existence it's therefore eternal you know it will always be in an existence okay and it does not depend on anything else for its existence it only depends on itself so let's formulate Anselm's ontological argument using that those definitions premise one is the same as the premise one in his in his original variation premise one is simply god is that than which nothing greater can be thought okay this a truly perfect being premise two contingent beings are inferior to necessary beings okay and premise three is because god is that than which nothing greater can be thought okay they must be necessary and they can't be contingent because if it was a contingent if god was contingent okay then it can't be that than which nothing greater can be thought because i could think of a version of god that is better than this contingent god i.e a necessary god okay so it has to be a necessary god and not a contingent god therefore god doesn't just exist he also necessarily exists he has to exist so this is uh, his second variation. It's slightly different to the first variation in, in, in key respects, but it uses the same kind of logic. So effectively, Anselm justified the last conclusion on the basis that for a necessary being to be necessary, it must also exist. So one of the definitions of necessary, uh, of necessity, is existence. So it's tautological in that regard. So let's have a look at some criticisms of Anselm's argument. And as you can probably imagine, there are a few criticisms of Anselm's argument because it seems that you could use this logic to effectively, um, you know, form uh, form the existence of anything, really. And this is what we found when we look at um, criticisms from even his contemporaries at the time. So one was a French monk called Gornillo. And Gornillo in his work on behalf of the fool argued that anselm's argument can be used to justify uh, as validly just as validly prove the existence of anything okay so let's work this example i'm going to use an example he used an example of an island okay and he replaced the the word god with an island this magical special island okay and i'm going to use the, uh, an example of island from thunderbirds ready so Premise one, Tracy Island is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. No greater island can be conceived. Okay, so we cannot think of an island that is better than Tracy Island. Premise two, something is greater, uh, something in reality, sorry, is greater than something that is simply imaginary. So therefore the first conclusion is, so Tracy Island must uh, be an imaginary, um, sorry, this is a uh, this is wrong. So Tracy Island must um, be um, real. It must exist in reality. Ignore what it says there. In order for it to be that, then which nothing greater can be conceived. No greater island can be conceived. Therefore, Tracy Island exists. So in conclusion, in the first conclusion, um, remove the word imaginary and put in reality. Okay. So I'm just going to read it out how it should be read. Tracy Island is that than which no greater island can be conceived. Premise two, something in reality is greater than something that is simply imaginary. So therefore, conclusion one, Tracy Island must therefore exist in reality in order for it to be that than which no greater island can be conceived. And that's therefore means that Tracy Island exists. This logic suggests that Anselm's argument is meaningless. Because if one can effectively replace anything to prove anything then it means that it isn't an argument for the existence of God. This is just an argument for the existence of anything. And we can prove it to be false because I could make up the argument for the existence of something that doesn't we know doesn't exist, i.e. definitely we know Tracy Island definitely does not exist. So let's look at some more modern-ish uh, versions of the ontological argument. Let's move away from Anselm and have a look at René Descartes' ontological argument. So apart from Anselm, Descartes also developed his own version of this argument, okay? And he believed that objects have what we call innate characteristics. An example of innate characteristic is oh, that of a triangle. So a triangle has three sides. The innate characteristic of a triangle is that it possesses three sides. Another example from Descartes himself 
is the innate characteristic of a mountain. One of the innate characteristics of a mountain is a valley, because in order for a mountain to exist, there has to be, uh, you know, a valley that where the you know the, where the mountain forms. And Descartes argued that just like triangles have three sides, and one of the innate characteristics of of, of a mountain is a valley, one of the innate characteristics of God is existence. So existence is a characteristic that is innate in something like God. So therefore God exists. So it's a formulation on, on the ontological argument. It's still trying to use logic uh, uh, to try and prove the existence of God. Where the ontological arguments f uh, got a lot of, a lot of uh, critique was arguably from um, Kant, from Immanuel Kant. Kant effectively, um, you know, sealed the nail in the coffin for most ontological arguments. So, let's come up with all of them. Let's just read them one by one. One of the most significant criticisms of the ontological argument comes from Immanuel Kant. Kant argues that the concept of existence, okay, is not a characteristic. And now, this really fundamentally shifts how we view the ontological arguments, because if we can... Because basically the assumption has been for the last, you know, however many hundreds of years when we are trying to argue for the existence of God using the ontological argument, one of the innate, um, one of the basic assumptions is that existence can be a characteristic of something. In Kant's language, um, he said that existence is not a, quote, predicate. Okay, predicates are things are describe what things are like, so, e.g., having three sides, being green, etc., etc., etc. And so, therefore, Kant argued that existence is not the same of uh, not the same as a predicate. It does not tell us anything about the object that was that would help us identify it in any way. So, therefore, it cannot be a characteristic of. Of a, of a thing so for example a cup one of the characteristics of a cup uh, may be that it is solid or maybe that it you know is a certain color or that it is in a certain shape okay in order to you know to hold liquid you can't describe a cup by referring to it existing we can't describe how, i can't if you want to if you wanted me to tell you uh, what a cup, um, you know, the characteristics of a cup, I couldn't say, begin by saying that it exists, because that doesn't really make sense. So therefore, it cannot be a predicate, and so therefore, existence cannot be a characteristic of something. Now, this is a big problem for ontological arguments, because ontological arguments work on the basic assumption that existence can be a characteristic of something, i.e. a characteristic of God. So, let's have a look at ontological arguments in modern philosophy because they didn't go away necessarily but they've not really had the same kind of uh, oomph as uh, the ontological arguments of of olden times ever since Kant so they've really been less popular however there are still some modern versions of the ontological argument one of them being Norman Malcolm okay what Malcolm did was accepted Kant's critique of the ontological arguments it's easier to just accept that as a critique, okay? But he still argued that the concept of necessity can be used to formulate a valid argument for the existence of God. Let's have a look. So this is a, quite a longer, uh, a much longer um, ontological argument, but let's just go through it one by one. So, premise one, if God exists today, sorry, if God does not exist today, okay, then he never can and never will, okay? Let's just make that clear. So if God does not exist today, then he never has existed and he never will exist. One of the key characteristics of God's existence is that he has to exist. You know, if he exists today, he has to exist forever. OK, because it wouldn't really make sense. Second premise, if God exists, then he must exist necessarily. Now, this is something you could argue about. You could argue that God could be contingent, in which point it really defeats the purpose of the kind of, the kind of traditional thinking of, of a God that we that we um, that we can try and um, formulate. So therefore, we try we gen generally tend to accept this premise as being true. This leads us to our first conclusion. Okay, so our first conclusion uh, is 
God's existence is either impossible, this comes from premise one, or it's necessary, this comes from premise two. So fundamentally, if we're thinking logically, God either exists or he doesn't exist. Okay, And if God exists, then he has to exist necessarily, this is premise two. If God doesn't exist, if he just doesn't exist, if, you know, today, if he just doesn't exist, then he never can exist, and he never will exist. Okay. Because if he never, if he does, uh, if it becomes a point that he does exist in the future, okay, then he can't exist necessarily. Does that make sense? Because we know that one of the characteristics of necessity, of a necessary being, is that it has to, ex it has to, you know, be eternal. Okay. If there's any uh, people that need to follow along with this, um, put it in the comments down below. I'm trying to be as clear as possible. So that's conclusion number one. Let's move on to premise number three. God's existence is not impossible because we can imagine a possible world where God does exist. So this is tying a little bit into the metaph metaphysical study of modality, but we'll just try and keep it, you know, we'll try and keep it. Um, you know for realistic for now so it cannot be impossible that God exists okay because you can imagine a world where God could exist okay let's imagine a parallel universe where God created it that's not impossible for us to imagine okay now this brings us into um, the distinction between what we would describe as being um, physically impossible and logically impossible so it may be physically impossible for for god to exist in this world okay but it might not be logically impossible for god to exist in any world we could think of a world where god exists i mean i say we could people have we've got people like you know uh, you know the founding fathers of of, of christianity islam judaism etc they imagined a world where god exists OK. And so it can't be the case that he's not logically it's, it's not logically impossible. Something that is logically impossible is something like a triangle having four sides. That doesn't make sense. The definition of a triangle is something that has three sides. That's logically impossible. We could not ever imagine a world where that could ever happen. But we could imagine a world where God exists. So therefore, it can't be impossible for God to exist. And so therefore, from the first conclusion, if it's not impossible that God exists, then it must be the case that he exists necessarily. Because if you look over here, look, from this first conclusion here, he either exists, sorry, his existence is either impossible or necessary. Okay, it's one or the other. It can't be both, because that would be a contradiction. Okay, it can't be either as well. It can't be the case that they both are false. And we can already show that it is the case that this one is false. It's not impossible for us to imagine that God exists. So therefore, the final part here, the fact that it has to exist necessarily, must be true. Therefore, God exists necessarily. Now, generally speaking, there are a number of objections to this argument as well. So on the whole, not many people accept it as a, as a philosophical argument. There are a number of objections, of course, for one, uh, one example is that Malcolm's argument is predicated on the concept that if God exists, uh, if God does not exist, it must be impossible for him to exist. You could necessarily, you could argue that maybe it's not the case. It might be the case that it could possibly exist, but then again, you would be getting into arguments about necessity and contingency. And there are also plenty of things that don't exist but aren't impossible. So, for example. It's not impossible that flying pigs can't, you know, that, that exist. That's not impossible. For example, you know, pigs might have evolved in a way where they grew to have wings. Or we just might, excuse me, we might have just designed, uh, when we were naming things, uh, you know, in the uh, when we were naming different animals, we might have named a bird pig. And therefore we have a flying pig. Therefore, it's not impossible to imagine a world where that is the case where the word pig means something different in a different world it means something that flies so that doesn't that's not necessarily impossible but it doesn't exist in this world we don't have flying pigs in this world 
Malcolm himself did recognise that his argument wouldn't convince any atheists, but he did still see that his argument was valid. So, ultimately, this argument is it is technically valid, this is true, but it does have a number of objections to it. So, in this lesson, we've done quite a lot. We've, we've done quite a lot of uh, talking. And, and what we're going to do in this next lesson is have a look at the cosmological arguments for the existence of God. And then we'll move on to the teleological, the moral arguments, then look at the problem of evil.